Oh, hello everyone. Greetings from the Inland Northwest, the homelands of the Nimipu Nez Perce tribe and the uh, Palutes Band of Indians. Um, I'm here to host today and carry, uh, introduce the readers and keep things moving, I guess. Um, I'm a contributor to the anthology. Um, so the Poetics for the More Than Human World, um, as most of you know, is uh, about maybe decentering uh, at the human and thinking of a through a broader uh, broader spectrum. So um, I want to welcome the readers today and I'm excited to hear the work. Um, Mary uh, Newell, uh, one of the co-editors, couldn't be here today. She did ask me to um, inform you all. Um, so I'm going to pop it into the chat. But the message from Mary Newell is. Um, since this is the last reading in the series, actually, so you know, congrats for that, everyone, Cole and and um, and Bernie and Mary, um, and everyone who's been coming for the past, I want to say, seven weeks. Um, sorry, Twelve. I'm not paying attention. Twelve. Twelve weeks. Okay, and um, this is the last reading. So Mary asked me to at, tell you all, if you did not sign up through um, Eventbrite to get to this link, and if you want to stay in touch for future discussions, send an email to uh, ecopoetics2020 at Gmail with the subject email list. And so I'll pop that, I think I can pop that in the chat if you um, wanna, <clears throat> I'm gonna pop it in again, oh. there's a typo. There's a typo. I, I've, pop, I've closed the chat for the moment. Do you want me to, I'm gonna open it again. Okay. Uh, okay, there it is. There's the address ecopoetics2020 at Gmail. Okay. So it is my great um, pleasure to um, open the readings today. Um, and with sadness, um, I have to note that Brenda Ijima can't join us today, but I encourage you to look at her work in the anthology, two, um, two really powerful poems about breath and wind on uh, air is especially resonating today through, um, through the West Coast of the US America. Um, all right, I would like to invite um, Angela Hume to kick off the hour. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Cole. And thank you, Bernard, Mary, and Sarah. And to everyone here who's um, in this virtual room. I'm going to read my poem from the anthology titled May the Human Animals. And some of the language in the poem is adapted from the IPCC special report from 2019, and also some other reports and writings, including writings on the US detention of child migrants, depression and human empathy. May the human animals learn new skills by imitation, fire the neuron when the action is performed and also when the action is performed in another, thus mirroring the behavior of that other. Reach net zero global anthropogenic CO2 emissions, stop the earth from receiving incoming energy from the plasma core radiating 4.26 million metric tons per second, more energy than the earth itself radiates into space, brighter disk, limb darkening, only the cooler layers that produce less light can be seen. May the human animals facilitate helping behaviors, stop the hoarding of food, supplies, medicine, the caging and modification of human and other animals, ensure the timely appointment of legal counsel for as many of the children as possible, stop the CO2 from soaking the reef, and also the worldwide reduction of a pH balance that marine calcifiers need to build skeletons, shells, corals, crustaceans, snails, even light harvesting algae encase themselves in carbonate platelets, radial, continuous, basket-shaped, disc-shaped, wishbone-shaped, rhombohedral, the colors of moss and tea, 
May the human animals redistribute across populations, change lifestyles to enable adaptation, fathom the relief of an earth without them. Imagine another human animal's thoughts and feelings from that other's point of view instead of from their own. May the human animals say, I am here. I know what you were feeling is real. Your life is important to me and you are not alone. Tunnel through a seemingly hardened crust to the warm, wet electrochemical center of a complex synapse structure. Hold tight the damaged organ, which holds tight, which holds tight the measure of attention. Slide with the body into the white crush of a quiet light. Love the body in its one life, its singular intensity. After all, I've been trying to write about community and care in these months after George Floyd's murder in South Minneapolis, which is the city in which I've been living. And also amid the total horror of the continuing wildfire emergency in the West, which is where I am right now, I'm in San Francisco. So um, I'm going to read some poem fragments, which are very new and which I've never um, read to anyone before. Uh, and they occasionally quote or adapt language from elsewhere, including writings by T.J. Talley and Sadia Hartman, uh, words of my friends, Elliot and Lindsay, and also words of an activist and resident of the Minneapolis Sanctuary Camp at Powderhorn Park, which was an experiment in community care this past summer. The streets are young and vital. As ever, we owe a debt. The night, wet, in the sick, dusk. Every history grips a crowd, conscious or not, in its fist. The streets are full of heroes tonight. Electric thrust, conscious or not, of the known world, simply gone. They were being fully human. Their kids were playing in the yard. Go into the poem, the crowd, the riot, knowing what you are, your daily, deadly potential. Comrade, conspirator, sister, lover, whatever you are, you're no le less lethal. Any friend, a cop, any discourse, a modality of the police. Tethered and bound to the white republic. Yes, there was, yet there was the beauty of the refuge in the heat, in the park. Donation needs included oral pain relief, cigarettes, 28 and 29 gauge syringes, sharps containers, contact solution, emergency blankets, sleeping mats, towels, sleeping bags, sweatpants. Despite predictable evictions, proxies of abundance. New XL t-shirts, duct tape, lanterns, pillows and cases, battery powered fans, compression bandages, phone chargers, hand sanitizer, pop. What we need is something beyond prescribed models of what they recognize as care. Do we protect what's ours or do we choose to live? Two. Vermilion August pummels thinner, distant branches. Vessels leak, a white opacity. Clots land in a lung. Below sticky water, molecules move with capillary tubes, drag hundreds of gallons up each coastal redwood. Root systems extend a hundred feet, entwine with roots of others. Even a downed tree can survive. Into our lungs ash of accumulated fuel loads, forests where we loved each other's body generously under the canopy on the spicy floor. After the lightning, surfaces of home bathed in gold as through a filter, sky splashed with corals, tens of thousands ordered to go. Before the month mark, light went out of the sky. Noon was a shallow dish of ash, translucent orange glass turned upside down. You cannot think your way out of a problem. You've got to use fire. Three in which we said no to the household's tyranny, in which we said no to withholding's economy. Contagion times, a time for choosing, clarifying acts of love and refusing. I'm wrapped up, I said, I'm in your hands. It's sweet, she said, isn't it? 
My bark thickens with every year now. I keep your words in my ear now. Tell me again what you did. Thank you. All right, thank you, Angie, for sharing first and bringing us um, mindfully into a community of care and a community of breath. I really appreciate that gesture. Um, now I would like to welcome to the podium, Craig Santos Perez. Welcome Craig, glad you could join us today. Aloha, can you hear me? Wonderful, uh, thanks so much to all the organizers of, of this series of events and the editors of the anthology and thank you Linda for the invite. Uh, it's 10 a.m. over here in Hawaii, so you might hear my kids <laughs> playing in the background. Uh, so, so please forgive the, the noise, uh, but it is a joyful noise, hopefully. I'm going to read three poems from my new book of poetry called Habitat Threshold. just came out from Omnidon. It's a collection of eco-poetry. The first poem is called Rings of Fire. We host our daughter's first birthday party during the hottest April in history. Outside, my dad grills meat over charcoal. Inside, my mom steams rice and roasts vegetables. They've traveled from California, where drought carves tinder into fire. Paradise is burning. When our daughter's first fever spiked, the doctor said it's a sign she's fighting infection. Bloodshed surges with global temperatures which know no borders. If her fever doesn't break, the doctor continued, take her to the emergency room. Airstrikes detonate hospitals in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan. When she crowned, my wife said, it felt like rings of fire. Volcanoes erupt along Pacific fault lines. Sweltering heat waves scorch Australia. Forests in Indonesia are raised for palm oil plantations. Their ashes flock like ghost birds to our distant rib cages. Still, I crave an unfiltered cigarette, even though I quit years ago and my breath no longer smells like my grandpa's overflowing ashtray. His parched cough still punctures the black lungs of cancer and denial. If she struggles to breathe, the doctor advised, give her an asthma inhaler. But tonight we sing happy birthday and blow out the candles together. <sighs> Smoke trembles as if we all exhaled the same flammable wish. This next poem is called uh, 13 Ways of Looking at a Glacier, and it's a, a recycling of Wallace Stevens. 13, among starving polar bears, the only moving thing was the edge of a glacier. 12, we are of one ecology, like a planet in which there were once 200,000 glaciers. 11, the glacier absorbs greenhouse gas. We are a large part of the biosphere. 10, humans and animals are kin. Humans and animals and glaciers are kin. Nine, we do not know which to fear more, the terror of change or the terror of uncertainty, the glacier calving or just after. Eight, Icebergs fill the vast ocean with titanic wrecks. The mass of the glacier disappears to and fro, the threat hidden in the crevasse and irreversible claws. Seven, O oh, vulnerable humans, why do you engineer seawalls? Do you not see how the glacier already floods the streets of the cities around you? Six, I know king tides and lurid unprecedented storms, but I know too 
that the glacier is involved in what I know. Five, when the glacial terminus broke, it marked the beginning of one of many waves. Four, at the rumble of a glacier losing its equilibrium, every tourist in the new Arctic chased ice quickly. Three, Shell explored the poles for offshore, offshore drilling. Once we blocked them in that we understood the risk of an oil spill to a glacier. Two, the sea is rising. The glacier must be retreating. One, it was summer all winter. It was melting and it was going to melt. The last glacier fits in our warm hands. Okay, my last poem is called The Last Safe Habitat. And it's dedicated to a native Hawaiian bird called the Kauai O'o, whose song was last heard in 1987. The Last Safe Habitat. I don't want our daughter to know that Hawaii is the bird extinction capital of the world. I don't want her to walk around the island feeling haunted by tree roots buried under concrete. I don't want her to fear the invasive predators who slither, pounce, bite, swallow, disease, and multiply. I don't want her to see paintings and photographs of birds she'll never witness in the wild. I don't want her to imagine their bones in dark museum drawers. I don't want her to hear their voice recordings on the internet. I don't want her to memorize and recite the names of 77 lost species and subspecies. I don't want her to draw a timeline with the years each was first collected and last sighted. I don't want her to learn about the Kauai O'o who was observed atop a flowering ohia tree, calling for a mate day after day, season after season, because he didn't know he was the last of his kind. Until one day, he disappeared forever into a nest of avian silence. I don't want our daughter to calculate how many, of my, how many miles of fencing is needed to protect the endangered birds that remain. I don't want her to realize the most serious causes of extinction can't be fenced out. I want to convince her that extinction is not the end. I want to convince her that extinction is just a migration to the last safe habitat on earth. I want to convince her that our winged relatives have arrived safely to their destination a wondrous island with a climate we can never change and a rainforest fertile with seeds and song. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Craig, for that, I don't know, vision opening towards seeds and song. Um, would like to welcome next to share their work, George Quasha. Welcome, George. Thank you. Hi. Um, Ms. Susan Quasha is here also, but maybe she will <clears throat> appear more centered as we move along here. You have to share the screen. Oh, well, you said my life. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, just to say that um, <clears throat> my piece in the anthology is actually a an essay called Eco Proprioception. And I'm obviously not going to read that because it's long, but I, I will read a couple of poems. And the <clears throat> Eco Proprioception, just to say it, is an extension of the idea of proprioception. And uh, proprioception is, the, for those who aren't immediately familiar with it, um, the physiological system, the neuro neurophysiological system that is self-recognizing. It is how we negotiate ourselves in time and space. And it's technically, for instance, how we find our nose in the dark. 
without our eyes or without anything else. So we know where we are, we know what we are through that system. <clears throat> eco proprioception is the idea that that actually is not limited to the body. It actually is a field and we're inside eco proprioception. And that if we could somehow realize that and make that active, we would be automatically more in contact with what we call the environment or the or nature or the world or others uh, at all levels. Who knows how far uh, once we activate that. And, it, and, uh, and the essay proposes that you can, you can study that, you can think that, and then it's a poetic phenomenon. So the poetry I'm going to read is actually, in a certain sense, a kind of instance of that. Uh, first of all, I, I call them preverbs. They're like proverbs, but they're, they don't embrace wisdom. They subvert the idea that wisdom is a thing you can repeat or, or, or own. They're a dynamic zone of syntactic um, um, process and awareness. And I've been doing it for 20 years. There, I'm on the 13th book. Six, of, six books have been published. Um, for the last two years, I've been doing it purely in collaboration with Susan Quash's photography. And um, this is, she gives me a photograph each day and then I, I, I work on the, the picture and um, with the picture present. But I, it's, it's resolutely non-ekphrastic since we were talking about that in the previous session. Uh, I want to be clear that ekphrasis is, um, involves description and the uh, assignment of objecthood and art status to the thing you're talking about. We do not do that. Her photographs do not make a particular claim of that kind and neither do the poems. They interact as a dynamic zone. I, I don't see the photograph till I begin working. Uh, and we don't discuss the aesthetics of these things. We just do it. So that's, um, that's what it is. And they, a poem is never more than a page. There are 34 in a series right now. Um, we've done um, about under, close to 400 of these in the last two years, which is well, during much of the time about one a day. So I will read them. And she, we're going to put our picture on the screen and, um, and I will read in the background. <laughs> This is the first image. Actually, people can link to, your, to, the, no, no, to where they, they are. No, it's too much trouble. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm gonna read the poem that goes with this image. Um, I, I don't have to go through the explanation again of what I said before, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So this is from a, a series called Hilaritas Sublime is the book and um, the view of the sleeping dragon is this particular series. And this is a couple of poems from within that series. Uh, poem number nine, gravity takes you from silliness to stillness and back. And there's a, uh, an epigram that says, never trust a truth, but for fun. And that's a statement by um, Antononymous, the particular, the, the pre-pre-Socratic sayings of Antononymous, the particular. You spot strange life by taking it your talk to. Life is also greed to grow on show. Why go to ground the visible, but to free the unseen show through. Lifeline is the cut across what lays in front in waiting. Pray the line unsatisfies. What nests in this appearance rests my egg for the coming birth by cracking. Seeing it fulfills the image desire for further meaning beyond seeing itself. It speaks true when actually possible to think. Is it lifest to limit silliness to the human? Chance seeing is what I'm not following, yet 
feeling followed by figures. Something takes up resonance when you give it life in the eye. Karma starts now and it's pay as you go. Time out means free to lose by freely not winning. Neutral is turbulence in surround and an infinity of options open at once. I crack, you crack, she cracks, shows us on par, still alien. Creeping out semantic shifts fuel up on innate restlessness. I'm on board if you tell me the standard by which I know its values and it mine. Right doctrine isn't self seeing right. It may see right before me. Everyone does not agree. Did you, did you hear my, everything? Did you hear the poem? Okay, so somehow it got muted again. Um, poem 13. Back to Naturans. You know best, it's life coming at you. The time never comes free of attitude. Oh, for a picture that speaks a thousand words. The wild refuge in you without angle. Trees talk, trees stalk. Rhyme and reason, rhyme to reason out loud. From an angle, trees inspire fear and fear inspires me. Never standing still plays music. I'm out to acquire what I see when full force hits home. I see that I miss the flower through the head. It's rare seeing music through the thing. Trees walk through without moving off. Not ready for good enough to be human is our common ground. Attitudes at their quickest lose edge in full view. Naturing disappears before it appears in full. Talk doubles for us. Grammatical shimmer shows through. The spiral release tears through tissue, breathing summer. Okay, that's two, two of the poems. That's what I plan to read. I have more, but let's go on. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to be so technologically uh, non-advanced. <laughs> going, let's be going back to nature here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George and um, Susan, for your photos. Um, no, go, go on to the next poet um, and let us figure this out. I'm sorry. Okay. I thought we were, we've never done it before, so I'm not sure. Okay, we'll come back to you. Okay, thank um, you. All right, so I would like to welcome next uh, Sharon Latting. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you, Linda, um, and thank you everyone for listening during these fraught times. Um, within the following excerpt of an excerpt, I relate poetic obscurity to the early phases of perception. Um, this is a sliver of an argument I make in a forthcoming book, um, the premise of which is that the genre of lyric poetry comes to cohere when it is seen as a reenactment of embedded perception. Um, 
Within this passage, I reference Charles Sanders' curses, semiotic uh, category firstness, that state in which the distinction making that at length gives rise to meaning exists only virtually or potentially, as it were. Um, in fact, it is the undifferentiated potential for meaning that obscurity evokes and welcomes into the poem. Obscurity in lyric inheres to a great extent in the materiality of its language, a designation that is half figurative, half literal. The physicality of language is double, existing as ink on a page or pixels on a screen, and as sound, manifestations that are slight but physical nonetheless. David Noel Smith characterizes primal vocalizations as, quote, raw quasi bodily matter from which language will be made, end quote, invoking a double significance for the term while stipulating that this so called matter is also a medium. Matter in the sense of substance becomes for Noel Smith something like a figure, it is quasi bodily, as it does for Blanchot whose figuring of poetry as a decomposing corpse suggests that it transpires at the cusp of the conversion of matter to energy or to other matter at the point of its evanescence. Sound is in fact physical as it is energic, but it is not technically matter since it has no mass. As Noel Smith suggests, it feels substantive nonetheless in issuing from and impacting the body. An emphasis on the materiality of language, whether written or oral, the so-called privileging of the signifier, correlates with its lack of transparency. The word that is not an unclouded window onto a referent commands attention, becoming, by virtue of its opacity, a thing unto itself. By way of its widely noted resistance to reference, lyric foregrounds the substance of its medium, matter and the verge of transforming to energy. As a physical system, language, like the physical world within which perception transpires, is an embedding system featuring, indeed, dependent upon the dynamic of mutual co-construction through which entities, words, are constituted of other entities, other words, of matter that is, in a sense, transformed into themselves in the process of signification. As words are informed by their denotations and connotations, they are constituted of elements transformed to become of themselves, elements that are then unrecognizable within their transformed state, but denoted by it. If language is conceived of as material in the sense of subsuming, the sense subsuming mutability, its potential to mean assumes the transformation of what is meant, and with it a kind of continuity. The word as sign is in a sense continuous with the linguistic units, it denotes and by which it is informed in the same way that sensory systems are continuous with informing matter energy, the reception and conversion of which is the catalyst to the construction of perceptual meaning. The words with which the words of the poem are continuous are in the matter of sensory stimuli spurs to the creation of poetic meaning. As a percipient consists within itself of other constituting and in a sense extant entities, photons, sense molecules, etc., by simply existing, that is by perceiving, it gestures beyond itself to what is potentially significant, to what has not yet been, but might be transmuted and thus signified. In other words, to the undifferentiated state of potential first pulse firstness. A word analogously is composed of denotative and connotative significance that takes the form of other words and thus points beyond itself to a complex of potential lexical meaning. Words like percepts radiate outward toward the entities by which they might be defined, that is to say, granted meaning and contour. Words that are in turn formed of others in a continuum mirror, mirroring the physical world. What renders this potential significance present and thus realizable within the poem is its disposal of obscurity. Lyric expression makes present and makes itself present to the fullness of the linguistic context it implies rather than ignoring it. What renders the sense the set of potential significance inaccessible and its variety indistinguishable or virtual is the materiality of the sign, percept word, that has transformed and obfuscated it merely by existing. Poetry liberates this predisposition of language to indeterminacy, releasing the fullness of its evocative power. 
shaping its stable, determined meaning, the poem puts potential meanings into play, airing them, and in so doing, acknowledges that the environment extends beyond the shallow focus that is the predicament of the fallen human. As lyric poetry re reflects as well as effects, this potential for connectedness and a replication of the same, its obscurity may become practically inexhaustible, the raison for its durability. As Shelley tells us, quote, all high poetry is infinite. It is as the first acorn, which contains all oaks potentially. Veil after veil may be undrawn and the inmost naked beauty of the meaning never exposed. In implementing a directionality outward into language as a whole, the genre foregrounds systemic connectivity and in so doing competes with and downplays language's aptitude for determined reference. It manifests the lexicality that resonates as a signifying physicality, a physical system of signs. At the back of opacity is capacity. This condition of potential connectedness, active while it is masked, must remain unseen since seeing, poetic and otherwise, determines lopping off ramifying potential. Both Adorno and Heidegger stress that the immediacy of poetic engagement is less than fully conscious. The physical connectivity that is the basis of the perceiver's relationship to its environs is likewise unconscious. Points of organismic environment connection within perception are themselves unperceivable. Biosemioses depend on the conscious registration of neither signs nor objects. This state is foundational to lyric utterance at the same time it is one from which the genre inevitably emerges, maintaining its linguistic embeddedness all the while. Potential meanings remain even as an interpretive acts beside them. Lyric returns one to this basis, to a physical groundedness, and in through which a perceptual means of meaning making mediated in language emerges. Poetic utterance flirts with obscurity then, not simply because its object is obscure, but because the poem of the mind's contention with the strange is accomplished by evoking the immediate feeling and embedded state of presence to potential. I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sharon. George, shall we? Um, jump to George Quasha. All right. How about I will welcome um, Charles. Okay. To, uh, he, uh, go ahead, Charles, take it away. Tell us what I'm you're doing today. Just going to say almost nothing. I'm sharing the uh, contribution by John Kinsella, who could not uh, be here himself and has very not dependable connectivity from where he lives in the bush in Australia. So here, I'll turn my share screen on, and here he is. Hi all, John Kinsella here, reading from Yantry Gully, Wheat Belt, Western Australia. I'm reading from stolen Belladong Noongar land. I acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land. And more than that, more than acknowledgement, I, I believe firmly and strongly this land must be returned. And I'm hoping over my lifetime that will be the case. This massive injustice is not only an act of theft, an ongoing theft, it's also um, a large part of why there's been such massive damage to the environment of Australia and the region I'm in. Through European farming methods brought in mass clearing of vegetation, less than 3% of the original vegetation, this great region, vast area, remains of 2.7 percent. The rest was cleared, um, massive problems with salinity, um, soil degrading, as well as obviously loss of habitat. The first poem I'm going to read is actually set about 120 kilometres south of here, down on the river that runs through the city of Perth, 
should I say, the city of Perth was built around the river. It's called the Swan River by the colonists um, because they saw black swans on the river. But it's Noongar name and it's Wadjuk Noongar land down there is Derbal Yerrigan. The skyscrapers referred to in the poem are largely resources, not exclusively, but many of them are resources, skyscrapers built by the mining industry because this state is ruled by miners and the mining industry. Massive, up north, massive iron ore mines that basically delete whole mountains, ranges. Um, but many other mining, nickel, uranium, and it's a long list right near where we are in the wheat belt, um, though it's primarily agricultural, a huge nickel um, pegging that's just taken place. It includes a large chunk of state forest, and it's incumbent on people like myself to stand up and try and stop this, which I will and do. That is what my life is. My life is an ongoing activism um, in itself, I, I believe, in I'm a pacifist, vegan, anarchist, but I believe in intervention. I believe poetry can be part of that, and I believe poetry can actually um, stop the damage that has to be done in conjunction with different kinds of presences as well, socially distanced as it is in the times we're in. So this is about a fledged little pie cormorant, and in the background across the river are the skyscrapers of the resources industry. No direct water contact activities. The James, after a river walk, fledged little pie cormorant. When look at the skyscrapers of the resources industry, back turned, feathers growing against the gas baggery, shock of awe, a fracking bankers. It seems I'm bothered by our pausing, our passing, our contradictory wonder. Look, but don't look. Respect its privacy, but wonder at the irony of health warning sign with a resculptured riparian. Out of the slick amnios extraction, the needle of towers into the lifestyle river. Lifestyle was before too, but views from feature windows or an air-conditioned walk in the park are reaching out to big end of town. Fledged little pied cormorant is a telepath, conveys just enough of where it has come from and where it will be going in its dive through our short-term memories. The broken beer bottle in the silt we cut our feet on, river infections that crawl up the leg, beautiful inflections of what's been done. Fledged little pie cormorant will switch colours against the backdrop of heat and rise, rise and then skim deep. The second poem I'm going to read is actually set in Ireland where we spent many years living in various periods. Uh, it's part of a lifelong series of poems, been writing for decades, called the Graphology Series. Um, uh, it's worth noting, you can probably tell from the surname, Kinsella Kinsella, as they would say in Ireland, um, is with Irish heritage, Irish migrants um, escaping English persecution, in the mid 19th century famine migrants coming across and becoming colonisers. And that irony and hypocrisy is something I explore a lot in my work and the bigotries and injustice that um, spread in all directions from uh, such contradictions. Um, graphology window 12, Kusan Gap, sweep backwards and forwards. Release is in both directions. Vista window, release latch to compile an impression, suppress sublime, or what can be got making do with, but still spread thin to edges the soft day. Rain makes edges smooth, even where you degrade yourself. The codes can be chained against the sedimentary flow of so long ago. The glacial rewrite, the dredging of moraine above ground, vate air of each trend. Making a living, habitating, visiting, heading out to the volcanic islands of Africa. Compilation of spread and impact of lens changes, shifting the Veropta settings, amateur or professional, light metering. Okay, well, I'll leave you with that. I should say Kusang Gap, or Kusang Gap, if you prefer, is near Bantry in West Cork. Um, and I'm interested in uh, all kinds of environments, obviously, um, and even in relatively denuded environments, 
um, the spatiality of that and how that can be protected as well, not just the vegetation heavy environments. But I mean, as I look out the window, your gums and jam trees, there are kangaroos down the bottom, the kidneys, they all move through freely. Um, we open the fences up to the reserves, so things move through defensed, as I put it, and um, it's a refuge here away from hunters and you know, shooters um, and general acts of uh, environmental vandalism you get a lot in the region. So, yes, in, empowerment to those resisting peacefully. Bye. Thank you. All right. Thanks for playing that, Charles. I would like to welcome Tyrone Williams. Welcome, Thanks, Tyrone. Thank you. I'm going to read uh, two poems um, about Somalia and then um, have a chance, maybe one of Brenda's poems too. The fact of a plena. A maritime disputation concerning the meeting place of two territorial waters understood as directed by the sector of a border, Somalia, or perpendicular to a coastline in accordance with latitude and longitude per international law, Kenya. The inability to resolve has had an impact on resolving peripheral issues, in particular, the determination of economic the contiguous zones and the distribution of minerals, biological and national rights. The impasse imperils both countries' ability to sell exploration blocks and to collect revenue from, from any subsequent discoveries. A reference to oil and gas deposits found off the coast of Tanzania, Mozambique. Hence, capital investments have been postponed, stalling the development of schools, hospitals, and beachfront properties, to say nothing of badly needed water treatment facilities and medicines to curtail the spread of waterborne diseases. However great the rise of proliferating and doctrine disruptors as miscegenation. That was largely a farm porn. This is a capsule history of Somalia. Melindi, Melindi. Abu Fadah's written accounts of Melindi follows tracks the Galanda River to its mouth, sound ledger on in which the pillar of Vasco da Gama balances is balanced by Mount Kenya, vector per vector as a credit, credit debt, correct era edifice before lapsing into a common era of undisturbed foliage and feral menagerie and crypt Jesus Muhammad arrests Christ the prophet until Sultan Majid pulls back the stone to enslave Melinda's corpse and order Melindy's release into a British protectorate as one absent or go Etc., chosen and resigned to a tourist resort overlooking the Indian Ocean, empty of pirate trawlers, merchant ships, and freighters steering clear of the hidden scarecrows of Somali piracy, filling the nets of Kenyan fishermen with the bounty of repopulated waters, cleansed in the absence of barges dumping waste. This is one of Brenda's handmade books. And the poems in this book, <clears throat> pretty funny, actually, even though they deal with some fairly horrific events. So I'm just gonna read one of these. Chubby, chubby picker, sorry, chubby, chub, chubby, piggy sow. That's the name of it. Chubby, chug, chubby, picky, sow, thick ingress and egress rows as we line the streets with sea creatures like manatees or scintillating sea worms suction to the entrails of multinational vacuum cleaners. 
This huggable dog is a lover of homo sapiens. You know them as bipedal knowing men. She traverses sidewalks like no tomorrowing violators, flirtatiously muzzled with non-muzzled jawline, to the park, to the playground, dog-like canine, wolf-like hound of hell, only because a you imagines it so. The mob in a sociological mode dispatch the victims, lock down jawbone, skillful use of police radio equipment. At the insurrection, we must meet were eaten, police the meat with the training of action. Non-revolt might include pets. This time it will be as violent as we come rest your case, resting on the bench by the disobedience entrance. Thanks. All right, thanks Tyrone. And thanks for reading a Brenda Ijima poem. Now, how about some discussion? I, I've opened up the chat room. Uh, so if you want to introduce something through there or just you know, feel free to unmute yourself and, and start anywhere you'd like. <laughs> I, I was struck this week by, um, by the notion of sort of two themes that seem to dovetail and maybe think, how are they related? And, and those themes were perception that came out obviously in the eco-proprioception, which, you know, what a great concept. And then in Sharon Laddig's, um, the lyric poetry as a reenactment of poetic perception. I'm, I'm sure I'm misquoting there a little bit, but that's, that's how I heard it. Um, and various other um, things that, that came out with that. Um, Tyrone Williams, uh, your suggestion about this, these border issues seem to bring up law as a matter of perception and based upon perception. So I was really struck with that. And, and then these issues of care. Uh, Angela's with the community care um, and the John Kinsella's demanding a kind of care seem to be really based in that. Um, and then also Craig Perez, uh, but she was the glacier, it seemed to be a, a plea for care. So I was wondering about the connection between perception and care and uh, if that might open up any, anywhere to go. Well, I can say that um, the idea of eco perception is that we care already, but we don't access that care. <clears throat> we are in sympathy with the environment, but we repress it the way we repress other things that we don't know how to look at, that we don't feel, that we feel alien to us because we don't recognize it as ourselves. I think the real problem, I mean, not to say that identity politics isn't as powerful as it is, it totally is, but one of the problems is our modality of identification. We identify at our own risk because we also limit ourselves to what we identify with. I think personally, my, express, my view is that racism is, a, is an identity, identification problem. People are too used to identifying with what's easy, with what they, what's familiar, with what they know already. So they forget their intrinsic connection to pretty much everything that's going on. And we can't process that amount of information, so we close it down. And uh, eco-proprioception is the idea that into us at the physiological level, you have the Buddhist notion of compassion, of, uh, of mind is, is, is a shared reality. It's, 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 it, we're all born of the same origin. And I say that's actually all the way down all the way down to the physiological level, to the environmental level. And when animals, we have so many examples of even wild animals bonding with human beings and vice versa, because it's, I think it's intrinsic if you can get rid of the fear element and the fear element is, is, is the big problem really. We fear what we don't know, we fear the alien. So I look at it at that level. My, my work is to the extent that I understood <clears throat> the essay that was, or the information that was being given, 
the time that I was messing around with technological things. I think that we do enact nature, that language is alive, and mm -hmm. that it's as alive as we are, that we need to somehow learn to treat it the way we would something that's alive, just because we don't know what it means for it to be alive or what form that life is, or what it means that there's this feedback zone between beings. Trees talk to each other. Animals obviously communicate very precisely because their, their existence depends upon it. But we don't know that. We don't know that directly. We know it at best, theoretically or philosophically or intellectually, but we don't really get that it's, um, it's real and it's happening all the time. And so that's, that's my view. <laughs> I took the um, perception you're talking about, Cole, as a kind of interpenetration of things, which happens in this eco um, proprioception, but it also happens in, you know, Craig's, uh, you know, 13 ways of looking at a glacier, where there's all these kind of interpenetration of the self with the environment. It, it occurs in uh, John's, uh, I, I thought of it at the end when, you know, he opens the uh, passageways up to animals coming through from the preserves. And, and, in, in, and in Sharon's sense, you know, the, the language of poetry allows that interpenetration. And I just thought that was a, an alive concept for me. And, and the interpenetration, and I absolutely agree with George, it's always there, but we don't always choose to uh, acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. I, because we, we don't know. <laughs> I think we'll go ahead. Oh, I just wondered, relating to what Charles was just saying about interpenetration um, perception as as a kind of an exchange or a transaction um, that um, it, Plato talks about perception and beauty as this kind of an exchange. And he meant, and which then immediately goes to this phrase that he describes a, a contagion of blindness. And so I was just wondering what the, the, the pandemic as a contagion, um, that's something like a kind of uncontrolled transactional perception, but what, what, whether the, the pandemic could be um, modeling something in a kind of horrible way, uh, which is creating a kind of totality, a kind of unity that's um, might be thought of as, as a, a kind of reciprocative perception, something following what Charles was saying, but just what we can learn from the contagion. Um, in relation to perception as a transactional event. Just a thought. I, I have something to say about that. Um, I agree. The pandemic, these events are, are in a certain sense neutral. We cause them, we're paying the price. I think we're, we're highly causal in the pandemic. And in that sense, it's a kind of awakening for us. Um, it's the first time in my lifetime that I'm aware that people are more or less thinking about the same thing over the whole globe. This is a unique, a new, a unique opportunity if we can only somehow see that at the higher levels, <clears throat> that something is asking to be noticed as, as in common between us. I mean, far as far as we, we looking at how horrible that all is right now, but under the most neutral conditions, uh, that is say all things being equal, forest fires are generally regarded as productive. They're part of the restoration process of the planet. Uh, it's, no, it's natural. These are man-made, man-caused, and, and of course they're horrible, beyond horrible. But somehow we have to see ourselves inside the event. We have to take it to heart. We have to we have to develop, it is syntactic, it's language. Who's the subject of the sentence of what's going on? Who's, who's the agent here? And how do we alter that syntax and open it up so that our, our perceptions change directly? Not because we reprogram them with better ideas, which is what, how we tend to go about it, 
we come up with appropriate ideas with correct ideas. We try to live them, but they don't, it doesn't seem to work very well because it doesn't penetrate all the way to the psychophysical level. Anyway, that's a, one, one response to what your point uh, interacted is. Uh, sorry, I, my video doesn't work. I can't do it without Mary. Um, but George, I had a question for you. Interesting about the fear of the unknown. Would, is, isn't it also curious that poetry and the arts and, and much of uh, the sciences are drawn to the unknown? Yeah, it's a question of how they approach that, isn't it? I mean, for you, I, and the comments that you've made in previous sessions, I, I take it that you value the unknown. You understand the power of the unknown. Right. We don't seem to know how to position ourselves so that we're accessing the unknown as a resource. Instead, we want to impose the known. That's, that's colonialism of the mind that's, that produces all the other colonialisms. Well, is, isn't this one of the areas where poetry can be mo most useful if you're going to view it as, as a, a tooling? Well, yeah, I mean, useful in the sense of, I, it, I would put it more like instrumental. Yeah, tooling, right, okay. Yeah, tooling, yeah, okay, yeah. I didn't hear that. But um, I would say that, for me, I enter in why I write every single day, why it's very important to me to stay inside language at the level of the of poesis of the poem. Without thinking of it as a literary event, I really had to stop thinking about my work as literature, as, as poetry, as a recognizable form. But as a zone of, of mind, body, language, interaction, so that it could teach me by my being willing increasingly to go into a state of not knowing letting it talk to me, with me, of me. So I don't know if that says- Yeah, that. absolutely, absolutely. So a single, a single language act is an invitation to participate in a, in a kind of wonder of, of being rather than uh, my rehearsing what I already think in ever more clever forms. So in terms of healing, in terms of healing, in, uh, not specifically poetry, but as healers, how, how, how do we propose um, making the unknown more tender, tenderizing the unknown? So people aren't as frightened. Just thoughts, you know. I, I wonder how that might relate. I mean, that seems, again, related to the issue of care and I was, I'd love to hear more about the community care um, things that Angela brought up. Um, is Angela still here? Ah, there you are. Uh, if, if you might see some links there and, and want to make a bridge or. Um... Yeah, yeah, I can, I can do that. Um, one thing. Yes, to everything that's been said. I, I love the connections that folks are making and thank you for all the really generous comments and work to kind of draw connections across what was read today. Um, it's uh, It's been really good. Um, I think in terms of, just Cole, going back to your kind of initial observation um, about observation, that, that perception has been a kind of theme. Um, yes, I was also thinking of giving an account um, and how across some of the poems that were read, um, poets seemed to kind of almost conceive of what they were doing as like offering an account or giving an account, like descriptive work was happening. Sometimes um, expressions of will, which I thought was really interesting. Like um, certainly in my own poem, May the Human Animals, right? Um, you know, expressions of what you want or don't want, like in Craig's work, um, expressions of what you might do or will do in Kinsella. Um, you know, so something about like, um, I'm thinking about that, right, as as kind of like a poet, like a poet's mood or ethics, like um, in a time of over overwhelming <laughs> uh, evidence, right? And sort of visible environmental collapse, um, the, the impulse or desire to um, give an account, uh, express 
uh, express will or desire, um, which which can become a kind of care, right? Like like it's a form of caring, it's a form of attention. Um, so I, I guess I'm just like trying to talk about um, like the kind of ethics of perception or a feeling of perception, right? And there's something about that that kind of will and a caring willfulness, right? That characterizes, or we might say characterizes some of what um, is happening in the work. I don't know if that resonates for anybody else, but I'm just, I'm just freestyling. <laughs> now, Angela, it definitely resonated for me. I was thinking about the way the poems that were read today, many of them are kind of an effort to forge a new identification. So you really need to be in the poem. It's hard to talk about the poem. I feel like after we're out of the poem, um, but I felt that was definitely happening um, with the kind of, um, juxtapositions uh, that were, you know, that were things that were being noticed and, and put together. But as you said, the kind of calling out, like the poem is now, a, you know, a, I don't know, we're, we have to respond to the poem in a way because it's calling out, it's making these gestures. So not only is the poem forging new identification in language as that vital active space, it's like as a I guess, as a literary document or whatever, we as readers are also being asked to forge our identifications to what the poem is noticing and asking us to do. Um, anyway, that came through for me. I'd love to hear um, from Craig, uh, if you wanted to jump in. Here, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. I love that question, thinking about uh, what Angela called the you know, the affects of perception. Um, and to me, so much of eco poetry is about feeling, expressing and cultivating a ecological consciousness or eco proprioception so that we can see and feel and think about, you know, the interconnections between between all things and, and all places in terms of the lo local and the global uh, between you and I. And I, I feel that, uh, you know, the poems that kind of help us see those connections and interconnectedness, uh, you know, then offer us the uh, kind of a path towards care or towards other kinds of affect. Um, you know, thinking about care, I actually have a poem called Care in my new book as well, because I feel like that's such an important affect right now in terms of, you know, also, of course, like sympathy and empathy. And if we could tap into those feelings, you know, that will lead us towards a more uh, ecological ethics in terms of acting in the world, living sustainably, um, caring about the plight of others. But yeah, thank you for that. I think of the question about <clears throat> contagion and, and also uh, maybe something about what Heller was asking too, that you know, there has been poetry that has addressed directly accepting contagion as natural process. I'm thinking of, for example, uh, Robert Duncan's In Blood's Domain uh, as one. And mm -hmm. I guess I think in this space, this eco-proprioceptive space, this space we live in, we, we do have to know that the contagion is a part of that space. The fires are a part of that space. And so I'm not sure, I, yes, we need to have this kind of acceptance, but I'm not sure we would ever necessarily want fear to go away. You know, uh, uh, fear is, you know, one way we negotiate this space too. Mm. Yeah, when you, you talk about contagion, Charles, you made me think of contagious poems like how you know, yes. they just fly across the planet, you know. <laughs> More contagious poems I'll vote for. <laughs> well, Burroughs thought language was a virus. Yes. You could have, yes. and, and so if that's true, then, then we notice how language spreads, how one person says something. I say eco proprioception, a few people, use the word in this context. And maybe we think a little differently together because we found a position in common that um, allows us to think a little differently at that moment. And we understand that somehow big part of the understanding is not happening in the word, 
the word is a, a sort of a touchstone, sort of a point of contact for us. And a poem is like that, isn't it? I mean, the idea that we're understanding what the person intends in the poem is a certain syn syntax of relationship. The understanding is that somebody is saying something and somebody else is trying to understand it. But I don't think that's what happens in language very much. Language is also communal. It's an effort. People are just talking to say, I'm here in the space, the way a bird sings or, 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 or is, is, is generating the kind of state of mind. A person walks in the room and he controls the, the state of mind of the room pretty quickly by what he says or how he, he communicates through his body. So the model of the poem could be more communal in that sense, that we don't know who's saying what, we're creating an opportunity of more precise interaction and a kind of sentience, kind of intersentience between us, something we, we share by our nature. If we really understood that the planet is of our nature, we could have prevented so much of this so long ago. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. And so fear is built into that. It's part of the rough edge of being. You walk into a dark alley and you, you, you might get a little scared just by the circumstance. It's part of who we are. It's generative also of, of insight and of connection. I think a lot of the problems of society are based on fear. Really, fear Mine, is at the root. You know, makes me think a bit of a, when, when Sharon was just uh, speaking early reading, um, mm -hmm. I really was curious about that space, that distance between the stable meaning, the potential meaning, and the word is sign. I think it relates very strongly to what you're speaking about, George, and also Heller. Yeah. regarding um, this tooling of the unknown. And Sharon, maybe you could elaborate a little bit about that distance between the stable and the potential and the, the signage behind it and how that opens up to kind of a larger understanding or, or um, the way that that can be tooled. I'm really curious what you'd have to say about that. But to build on what George was saying, I think there's a sense in which a poem is an environment of sorts, as much as it's a record of perception. Um, it also prompts perception um, and that we do attend to poetry in the same way that we attend to an environment when we are being um, conscious and conscientious. Um, uh, the space between stable and potential meaning, I mean, I think that that's something that we we should negotiate. Um, and we do negotiate as organisms um, on a daily basis, right? We're, we're, um, we're, we're confronted with potential meaning every time that we encounter something new, right? Um, like the coronavirus um, and that successful action toward it is a matter of, um, of entertaining that potential and, and letting it have its space. Um, and, and sometimes that's a, a very quick action and sometimes it's an elongated process. Um, um, I'm also taken by the fact that eco-consciousness um, has to both um, engage with this direct um, kind of contact with an environment, um, but also in larger scale knowledge that um, we do in a sense get from an environment, but not, not in the day-to-day -day sense that we think of it. Um, that, uh, uh, you, you know, yes, it's natural to respond with fear um, in certain situations, uh, but, but we also need to bring in that uh, larger scale knowledge to, to bear on uh, how we're acting and perceiving um, so that we can survive. Right. It's not simply a matter of, of an organism and environment. It's a matter of many organisms um, amalgamating information and analyzing information. So, a number of things mushed into one comment. <laughs> the poem is environment, I think, is a powerful idea. Mm. I think when, you, when you're inside the poem, it expands to the world, to, to beyond the world. It's, you, you put yourself in a certain sense at risk of not knowing, of not understanding, of not getting it. But a poem teaches us to cherish that state, to, um, 
to learn to relax into that state as a potential, as a source, rather than the way it's probably been taught to us too often in schools. And certainly in the early days, I think po poetry was a traumatizing factor for me, <laughs> um, the way it was taught to me. But I think it's, it's the possibility of, of being in alternative worlds is, is powerful. And when that language is so textured as language, whereas in prose you have a tendency to get carried by the story, I, I try to bring it back to the immediate moment of the line, of the word, of the, of the dynamic of the moment, and to suspend all, all, all uh, sort of convenient ways of, of not being completely present with that, that fear that maybe I'm responding to my early years of, of, of trauma. I, 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 I like that. It suggests that the poem can, uh, if someone enters into the poem, it, it, it might create an anxiety, which will also open up a vulnerability in, in, in the reader. And exactly. that vulnerability, and, and we're talk, talking about fear of being, a, perceiving fear as being a big uh, problem in terms of uh, da the danger for the planet. If you people open up those gates and and begin to see how the vulnerability can actually pay off and, and provide richness, it would be it's quite interesting. I'd also like to bring up another, uh, just put out, put out there something. Um, there's also, I, I think, a lot of nutrition in the poem that instead of the, the meaning or the apprehension or the, the making intelligible, the poem that in, uh, introduces us to, and leaves us in, in the bewildered. Mm -hmm. In, in other words, the richness of perplexity. Mm. Which is a mirror of the world in the sense that there's such great complexity. Part of our limitation in being able to understand the alien, the, the, the unfamiliar, the other, so to speak, is that we can't handle it. We haven't learned to handle direct complexity at that level. And maybe that's what poetry teaches most. Great How point. Being side language and to attune ourselves to the richness of the world that's available to us when we open beyond our normal limitations of that. That's, and, that's eco-oasis. Yeah, right, and how attractive it can be. Yeah. Which the culture, I mean, of course, tries to uh, uh, suff what is literally, it? Snip, literally, suffocate. Literally ecstatic. You're outside of yourself. You're, you're beside yeah. yourself with the others. Yes. And you have to risk that. That's very, very tough for human beings to learn to do. So very few can do it consistently. I'm thinking about this, um, the proprioceptive um, kind of outward projective um, look or gesture or orientation. And I'm thinking, and, and like, yes, yes. And I'm also thinking of how, um, poems are, as you say, these um, vulnerable, and as I kind of think of them, like porous <sighs> containers um, that the world gets into, you know, um, and that actually that's also something really powerful that poems could do is just kind of like take in um, and contain the world and the history, like material histories, social histories. I was thinking of um, the capsule history, the phrase, the capsule history that Tyrone used, you know, and um, so it's kind of, it's, it's both, right? Like these are, these are the, the sort of two, the two ways in which poems operate, like they both um, project into the world, right? And sort of create, create world and expand world and they're expansive, but they also, um, they also like absorb and metabolize and register and bear witness to um, material histories and social histories. Um, just a comment. But if we move uh, move past the, the poem and look at all of art, you know, it's really fascinating staying in, in touch with this theme, how things that were scary and, and, and perplexing uh, some time ago in a lifetime, like a Jackson Pollock action painting they were making fun of, or if, when uh, Do Eric Dolphy and John Coltrane, the jazz critics originally mm -hmm. said, this is not jazz. Now you hear it in elevators and, and it's common common parlance. So it's fascinating what was once once uh, frightening, fearful, and dangerous is now embraced, you know, taught in schools and, and, and universities, you know, and jazz classes. Well, Gertrude Stein thought we should keep it that way. <laughs> That's the way. In order for the poems to be 
to be continue to do their business, to do their role of of, of reorganizing our our, our awareness, um, they had to stay somewhat um, uncomfortable for us. Mm-hmm. She certainly managed that quite well. Yeah. And Heller, you may know Fanny Howe I wrote yes. an essay, "Bewilderment," the word you used, saying that is that's the truly spiritual state. Yeah. And it seems distinctly related to the ecstatic that you brought up, George. It, it's a, a being outside oneself. Um, and it came up and we talked about that word bewilderment quite a bit. The second or third discussion after these and um, the idea that the word includes be wild. Mm. And so it you know, suggests a, a that way of being outside oneself, of being mm-hmm. outside one's tamed nature or um, preconceived nature and access to a different kind of nature that is expansive in that ecstatic way. Yeah, absolutely. I like the notion <laughs> of psychonautic, of, of we are travelers in, 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 in the, on this planet. We're travelers, the planet itself is a traveler. We're, everything is traveling, moving on. And yet we try to hold it back. We try to pin it down. And I think poesis is, uh, is psychonautic automatically, that it, it takes us outside of our limitations right away. Psychonautic. Psychonautic. <laughs> That's a great term. Yeah. It's, a, it's like traveling, mind traveling, soul traveling, being yeah. traveling, life traveling. We like to travel, we like to go places. Human beings are always trying to get around the planet to find something new. And that's the beginning of it all, how, they, how the, the migrations occurred. They weren't all driven by necessity. They were often driven by curiosity, by wonder, oh, something new. How is that different from what you do when you start the poem? Mm. You know, Angie, until you mentioned metabolism, I hadn't thought about the capsule, um, you know, the capsule history of Somalia as something, you know, that, that was swallowing, but that was a really interesting way to think about what was going on in, um, in Tyrone's uh, poems, taking us, um, and plus t- I've been thinking a lot about the, the gaze, you know, re-inhabiting the gaze in poetry that kind of got, you know, lost, but um, thinking about it that way and the, the global um, and the way, you know, Tyrone took us to a, a completely different coast, of a completely different continent and, um, you know, um, to talk about some of the same issues. Well, no, because it's, you know, the um, resource extraction, right, in, in, in a disempowered country. And um, I don't know, Tyrone, I'm just wondering what, what's up with taking us to Somalia? What, what's that for you? What's up as in, why did I do it, you mean? Yeah, what you're, you know, what you're thinking around oh, um, well, addressing uh, Somalia. Um, well, I guess um, one response to that is I, I was curious um, several years ago about the way in which the whole question of Somali piracy flared up in the media about 14 years ago, 15 years ago. And then of course, as in so many other media events, you know, sort of died down, even though it was still going on. Um, and so what I, you know, that led me to think, you know, do some research about the history of the country um, and the way, like so many other countries um, has been, um, a, you know, a place that has been, you know, sort of, um, I guess you could say, you know, it's, it's a place to, to take from that, you know, over the centuries, you know, one European country or, you know, has, or another has occupied, you know, that land. Um, so that, and that along with uh, the question of territorial waters that the, uh, the piracy began as a way of trying to um, protect those waters. Um, from um, primarily J- Japanese 
Chinese um, um, and British um, and French uh, freighters and trawlers and so forth. And also the fact that those territorial wars became the dumping sites for nuclear waste for you know garbage from other other countries. Mm. And so what began, what you know, what turned out, what was perceived or portrayed as strictly an illegal activity, um, piracy actually had a history in uh, an attempt to protect uh, property, um, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that that led me to into those kind of issues in uh, in that book. Mm. We were just talking about gays a minute ago, and for some reason, I thought of Medusa. And I thought, what is it about her gaze that turned people to stone? What does that signify to anybody here? Uh, gaze is a huge concept. I mean, I wrote a piece on Giacometti. Giacometti says uh, the gaze is the truth of, of the soul. I mean, it's a, it's, that's a wide topic. Uh, just this, this, I just found the, I, some, I wrote three poems called Be Wilder. I'm just going to share the yeah, uh, it's in in my un uh, collection, and I'm just gonna. I sorry about the video. I'm, I don't know how to get on it. Anyway, there's one line I thought was interesting. Be wilder to spend a lifetime rummaging foam. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not the whole poem. It's just a line I liked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of dealing with, you know. Uh, inspection, witnessing, not knowing, uh, you can just spend a whole lifetime just rummaging foam. It also makes me think in some cultures, ancient cultures, the eyes were the sun of the body. Mm. Just free associating. Uh, that's it. Some of the things of getting to the point in the poem or in the experience where you you can't quite handle it anymore according to your ordinary ways of doing that. And so there can be this expansiveness. I, I love it that those were moments that, you know, the poet HD called them her jellyfish moments. Mm -hmm. I love that she's finding uh, an image of an animal that almost could not be more alien to a human, but then taking that otherness into oneself to explain this transformation. And that seems to be involved with what several of you are talking about today too. You know, transformation and the possibilities of transformation through uh, encounters in the um, Eco proprioception and and very and in the language modes of poetry, and that goes back so perfectly to the Medusa, as the Medusa yeah. of the Medusa is a word for jellyfish in a number of languages. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really great little. Oh, thank book. you for that. Thinking, oh yeah, the way in which taking yeah. that alien into yourself is also a matter of looking out. Um, in a new way, uh, wow. in a way that's alien to you, uh, adopting an alien mode of perception. <laughs> but HD also pairs that jellyfish mind with her uterine, I mean, with the love region. She calls it the love region and kind of that suturing of, of body and mind um, is, you know, part of that too. It's mm -hmm. uh, full, full body poetics feminist full body poetics too. Mm -hmm. Medusa's gaze sees into your terror. That's why uh -huh. she can. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, my old teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's also interesting that a lot of the changes that are, are occurring uh, in ocean environments I found, I found it. are reflecting oh, themselves oh. in. Oh, God. Blooms of jellyfish. That is, jellyfish are prospering. The things that we're doing in the ocean are expressed in jellyfish, right? In, in tremendous, like, jellyfish appropriation of the 
that raise of the ocean. Mm -hmm. A documentary says, what made the difference between a dead man and the person was the gaze. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, now, if we honor his assertion, he also says, verity, truth, dwelled in the gaze. So if we honor that, why? Well, I, I talk about that, but I'm just throwing it out there for other people to consider. Yes, say that again. Uh, so for Giacometti, truth dwelled in the gaze. So if we honor that statement, truth and truth is what he sought from art. Uh, so if we honor that, in what sense is the gaze truthful? I, I, I have answers to that, but that, that's no, uh, I mean, I don't want to read you the essay, but I'm just throwing, I, you know, you, meant, you brought it up, Ruth, so I yeah. thought it was important to dwell further in, in the, let's say, the complexity of the gaze. I almost, been, I almost wish you would read us a few paragraphs. All right. Let me see what I got here. Uh, I had to, okay. All right. So anyway. He, felt, he goes back to the Hebrides. Uh, okay. This actually does coincide with everything we were talking about, so I'll, I'll do that. I'm sorry about the video again. Where in the gaze is the secret of life? Well, how does the gaze differ from the look, the peer, the regard, the delve, immerse into, or what Van Gogh called watching? To give gaze as wide a berth as possible, Gaze will be viewed as inclusive of the above terms plus others that satisfy the criteria of any prolonged and intense seeing whose intention is to peer into with an eye toward extraction. What is it exactly that we are hoping to extract? It is this, the essential beingness of what is on view. It's quintessential quiddity, the that which is before one, which presents itself as appearance. And this part's important because it goes back to eco. Today, the entire sensory realm has been hijacked by what Frederick Jameson terms the logic of late capitalism. With, with stimulation assaulting, assaulted with an increasing barrage of images, commerce has identified the I as the ultimate consumer and has targeted it accordingly. The eye, coerced to the gallows of expenditures, is voided of gaze. When not under the attack, the eye is entrained into instrumentality by tracking the useful. It's a primary physiological component of driving one's vehicle to the shopping mall where it can follow the purposeful cues that stop and shop, i.e. aisle five for soap, blah, 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 and two for cereal. The eye no longer seeks but computes. Mm. That gives you some idea, you know. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. I wonder what anybody, Heller or anybody else, uh, thinks about looking for the essence when you're gazing. Well, that's just what I was talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. why. Oh, okay. It, it makes, it puts me in mind <laughs> of uh, what, uh, Louis Zukowski had to say about the eyes, you know, the, the eye, love is to reason as the eye is to mind. So through that sensual, uh, perceptive experience is what all, you know, thought in the mind springs from. But as we put it to use in the world, we need that love to inform that too. And it goes back to... The Clayton Eshelman quote I gave, uh, yeah. to be a poet is to be in conversation with one's eyes. Right. <laughs> Gaze is different from watching and looking in the yeah, normal yeah. sense of words. Um, Blanchot has this essay called Gaze, The Gaze of Orpheus, and <clears throat> it's automatically transformative. It's, it's got a forbidden element within it. Gaze is something, if you gaze at people inappropriately, they're, they're automatically offended. Mm -hmm. it, you you want per, you want to give permission to be gazed at. You don't want to be randomly gazed at. 
um, it's penetrating. It's it violates your private space. Yeah. Huh. Uh, and, uh, I'm so, sorry, go, George. Go no, no, go ahead. Uh, so I just read that come what it, what George just said. I, I'm I'm uh, a- adding to from another page in the essay. Uh, the gaze is more than mere reception. Prolonged deep seeing releases the seer, and don't forget in seer you have the word seer, and model with the situated as they fuse to a current charged with shimmer. Someone else mentioned shimmer. Oh, George, grammar. Yeah, shimmer, grammar. With diffuse and formulation, new livelinesses spawn, unlikely shapes appear. The trans retinal whirl blends with the strictly perceptive. Dimension oscillates, horizon flutters, optical fireworks bedizen. This coupling, this interosculative otherling, constitutes the magnificence of the gaze. Less dialogue than Congress. Mm. Where is this essay, Heller? Uh, it's in, I, I forgot which book it's in. I, I don't know. I, it's one of, one of my books. I have to find <laughs> out. Oh, it's actually also was published in Talisman uh, magazine. Oh. Or if you send me, uh, uh, if I, I'll, I'll send you the link. Great. Well, basically, it came from Giacometti, my my, my uh, attention to it. Who, who, I mean, made it, that was life was based on it. Yeah. Do you, you gaze into the eyes of animals? Anybody here had experience gazing into the eyes of animals? And that's an, what you, go ahead. That, that's it, interesting because you gaze into some dog's eyes; they'll bite you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, I was just talking to someone who says that he has learned how to hypnotize animals. Mm. And uh, so when he goes fishing and he sees frogs, he picks up a stick and he waves it back and forth three or four times. And the, the gaze of the frog is hypnotized by that. And he says he's also learned how to hypnotize giraffes. Mm. Uh, I don't know how he gets up there to do it, but uh, I, I I asked him if I could go with him the next time he goes out to hypnotize an animal. <laughs> Wild animals don't look humans in the eyes. Yeah. The difference between a wolf and a dog is that your dog will stare you right in the eyes because they've learned to interact with the human mind. Yeah, They're, and cats won't either. Yeah, but but wild animals don't don't yeah. see that way. They see body movements. They see it they register something else is significant. Not, not the it is, it's a sign of aggression for many of them too, right? Absolutely. You don't want to look a bear in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting that most of the, the perception in, in today's conversation has revolved around the retinal and the eye. You know, I, 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 I like to uh, suggest we circulate that into seeing with the ear and, and, and the smell and touch and, and, and in the full panoply of, of the sensories. You know, well, to go back to eco proprioception, that's a whole full body. It's full yeah. mind, full body. And actually, the visual aspect is it prevents you from um, actively engaging in proprioception, uh, eco proprioception, because it isolates something down to a point of focus, which is very, very controlling of the moment. It, we do it in order to control the moment, to hold it in place. But the ears, are responding in surround, and they, they, they don't have that controlling aspect. Why music is so powerful in a different way. George, do you know um, uh, William Cronin's Trouble with Wilderness? I mean, because I'm thinking, I'm thinking your idea of eco perception and how you know we we care, but we don't know how to care. Right. Um, and, you know, because we don't recognize what we're caring about as a part of us, it's right. like that's a uh, that's Cronin's sort of argument with the trouble, the trouble with wilderness is that we think of wilderness as something out there and we don't recognize it, you know, right here where we are. So, I mean, yeah, but, but it get get back to the idea of the kind of, you know, schism, mind, body schism and how to kind of heal that schism. 
right? Yeah. Or that that, sep- that separation that we've learned through, you know, Descartes and Western rationalism. And, I mean, that's really what I meant by re-inhabiting the gaze, you know, as a habitus, as a, you know, as um, where, where you're, you know, living, you know, living in the gaze and um, right. Right. so that, that you're acknowledging what's near you as what's part of you, like that <laughs> basic kind of ecological, you know, mm-hmm. move that has to happen. Right. Yeah. But um, I don't know how, we don't seem to mention much the work of Gregory Bateson anymore, but. Yeah, I was thinking of the Gaia, no, I know but, it's not Bateson, oh no, but. Not, not the Gaia so much as the um, uh, the ecology of mind, steps toward yeah. ecology of mind. The whole modality of thinking has to change according to Bateson. And this is what I think is fundamental. We don't, it, it, it's a great loss that he's not very much in the forefront of eco poetics and um, ecology. It should be mentioned often because uh, he tried to get us to think differently. Well, science, science, ra- rational scientism sort of took over the whole. Um, understanding of ecology it's not it's not in the humanities anymore it's not a part of the humanities Um, part of the sciences so yeah that is unfortunate well it's it's not it's not that the science couldn't doesn't have the potential to interact with the other things it chooses not to it's it's bounded by uh, the idea of a rational approach Mm -hmm. to truth and to reality Mm -hmm. and was very much a way beyond that It's worth going back and rereading, as I've done recently, um, Steps to an Ecology of Mind in the, the subsequent book, Mind in Nature. I was thinking in, uh, oh, by the way, Ruth, I, I, it's in on my book, UN, the Giacometti. Okay. Uh, going back to um, Bewilder, I, I wrote three poems on, on, on go be wilder, B-E dash be wilder, which just goes back to what George was talking about. But it's also kind of curious to me in this discussion to consider uh, to, to consider the gaze and bewilderment twinned. You seeing them in the same context. Mm-hmm. 